Hello and welcome live to the World Crypto Network. Here again to the next show of Reed Rothbard and Use Bitcoin. We are talking with the one and only Murad. So Murad, hey, what's up? How are you doing? Doing well, man. How are you? Thanks for the invite once again. Well, of course, it's it's fantastic to have you on. Um, you are one of the fascinating and, and really smart young economists out there uh, who are not just, you know, boring economists, but actually, uh, you know, uh, cypherpunks and libertarians at heart. And of course, Bitcoin followers and cryptocurrency followers. And you are a must stop, a, a, a uh, absolutely must follow on Twitter. Um, Thank you. So 100 um, percent. The reading today is going to start us off with the nonsensical aspects of uh, having several coins and uh, the the multi coin uh, shittery so uh, we are we always <laughs> like to 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 bring it back to uh, old school economists okay uh, so this is hans hermann hoppe quoting ludwig van mises first to start off with hans hermann hoppe faced with this challenge of unpredictable contingencies Man can come to value goods on account of their degree of marketability rather than their use value for him as consumer or producer goods. And consider trading also whenever a good to be acquired is more marketable than that to be surrendered, such that this possession would facilitate the future acquisition of others directly or indirectly serviceable goods and services. That is, a demand for media of exchange can arise. For example, a demand for goods valued on account of their marketability or resaleability. So what do you say to that? Sir? Yeah, um, it's very important. Austrians always underline the importance of saleability and marketability and recognizability of a good um, when there, when sort of monetary phenomena emerge. These particular characteristics are very important for what a given society or a given group of agents are likely to choose as their media of exchange. Um, and the following quote in particular, if I may continue, um, there's an inevitable tendency, and, and this is Hoppe quoting Mises, an inevitable tendency for the less marketable of a series of goods uses media of exchange to be one by one rejected until at last only a single commodity remained, which was universally employed as a medium of exchange in a word money. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because there are still very many prominent members of the quote unquote cryptocurrency community and you are even more likely to find them in the quote unquote blockchain community. But there's a lot of people who think that when this whole thing is is um, said and done, there are going to be five or six cryptocurrencies um, or there's going to be several cryptocurrencies. Um, and to me, this is this just shows a misunderstanding of monetary history. Now, within those people, the more moderate they say, okay, sure, the first one is going to be the biggest, but uh, it's not going to be when I take all, it's going to be when I take most. And obviously that's getting closer to the truth. But I think still to this day, many people underestimate how much bigger the first one is going to be. And if you look at the graph of the ratio between gold and silver, it was pretty stable between the years like 1600 and mid 1800s and then once the practice especially across europe and elsewhere uh once it became common that um uh, once sort of, sort of paper and representative money which is backed by one commodity or another became common in circulation and also once india and china also ended up moving away from the silver standard towards the gold standard um the the silver to gold ratio or rather the gold to silver ratio began increasing quite rapidly and to a point where even if you look at even if you compare these market caps today and it, it might not be the best comparison but it's one of the few ones that we have 
even though both gold and silver has have largely been demonetized the total market capitalization of above ground silver is around 50 to 52 billion while the total market cap of above ground gold is somewhere between 7 to 8 trillion which means that the difference is somewhere around 160 times which is i mean for all intents and purposes that's winner take all right and I expect something similar to happen in the cryptocurrency realm. Now, a lot of people are saying, oh, like these aren't metals. This is, and I hate this phrase, but they say um, this is money wrapped in technology. So it's going to be completely different. Now, I strongly disagree with that. And I think that it like the so like what's important here is that we need to analyze these systems as money first and software second and really it doesn't matter what they're wrapped on like i like to as loose as, as a metaphor as this is i like to say that here the money is the food and like the technology is simply the tray it's only the rail and i don't think it's going to be that different because at the end of the day it's not so much about the wrapping or the wrapper uh but it's more about human psychology and it's more about human behavior and game theory and psychology and really what sets of humans and sets of large sort of uh, agents converge upon in choosing what they define as their money and what they define as their monetary standard so i still i believe i believe that bitcoin will take more than 92 93 percent of the market exactly it, it is truly all about the, which vision is ultimately going through which shelling point is going to be emerged? What is going to be the consensus? There is going to be this this one mainstream and and most uh, persuasive th view of uh, which currency is going to be the true currency, and see it as a usability uh, see it from a usability standpoint. Uh, who or wh what is going to be easier? If you have uh, several different currency, every little town has its own currency, every little user group has its own currency. And you have to price all your goods, not just, uh, you have to price them, not just in one currency, but in many of them. Uh, you have to price in in Litecoin, you have to price your goods in, uh, in Monero, you have to price your goods in Bitcoin, you have to price your goods in IOTA and what else. It, many different prices that you now have to keep in mind. and. Uh, this is a lot more to handle and a lot more advanced economic calculation compared to if you all, all only use Bitcoin. Everyone well, I can... wouldn't. I wouldn't just call it advanced. I would actually go as far as to call it inefficient. And I, I, you bring up a very good point, and I always say the exact same thing. I tell my friends who are still like not, don't really understand the monetary like dynamics that are likely to happen, at least in my view yet. And I like to say, would you want to walk around New York? and use a different currency at a different store. Like that makes no sense at all. We, you want to, so money is in stocks. You don't want to diversify. You actually want to converge among, uh, uh, you want to converge upon the winner. And the winner is going to be much, much bigger than even number two. I don't think that number two is even going to take 10% of monetary media in the far future. Well, okay, interesting. Why do you think it's it's in the 90, 90% uh, uh, area? Um, maybe isn't it going to be more of a Pareto and the 80-20 uh, uh, distribution? I mean, so just looking at gold, it's more than 100 times bigger than silver. And I mean, money is um, supposed to be a good that is, as we said, the most liquid, the most saleable, the most marketable, the most recognizable. So even if you have a world where it's like 70, 20, 6, 4, say, for example, I th I just don't think that that equilibrium can persist. I think like it needs to dive, it needs to essentially converge further and further and further because essentially like anyone who's holding that the one that's 20 percent, that's r it's riskier to hold that rather than the big one. And I just think that as as we've discussed previously in a world where there's no legal tenders there's no debt extinguishing laws there's no state decrees and there's no sort of this authoritative local monopolies on money um it's likely to converge to an even more extreme version and just like we've seen with gold 
once silver gets demonetized, it gets demonetized pretty quickly. And money is a store of value. One of the things that makes it a store of value is its extreme liquidity. And I just think that, uh, what, as, as Hans Hermann Hoppe says, one of the purposes of money is to reduce anxiety about an uncertain future. And in that particular equilibrium, the Pareto equilibrium, I think it would even be more, more extreme than Pareto. Because um, you, if you want to maximize your liquidity and if you want to minimize your uncertainty as much as you, as much as you can, then you want to allocate even more than 70% to the winner. Okay, very, very interesting. Um, and and I do agree with with pretty much everything you said. And uh, absolutely, uh, there is a did lot you, of. Did you did you ask that question just to play devil's advocate, or do you actually think it's going to be seventy eighty percent winner? Uh, no, I I do think that there is going to be a very 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 strong inclination um, to right. to only use one currency, and especially right. uh, because it's not 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 just the economic, uh, but also uh, more also importantly the. Uh, the open source uh, protocol level um, right. uh, aspects that uh, that will ultimately drive uh, uh, to being used only one language and one money uh, uh, to coordinate uh, the entire uh, economy. That will make a lot of sense. Um, and what what I do uh, would like to you know strong arm uh, uh, strongman the opponent again is that they say especially uh, with Lightning Network and um, you know the ability of routing payments uh, throughout several currencies. So doing on Lightning Network uh, routing uh, uh, swaps, uh, multi-currency swaps, multi-currency hops. And uh, this is possible already today. Um, it has been done with like uh, Bitcoin to Litecoin uh, and stuff like that. So it is possible. And now with the possibility of really efficiently and really cheaply switching from one currency to another, even in at the point of sale, during the pro during the process of payment, but atomically, so that the person uh, either gets the Litecoin and I give away the Bitcoin, or it doesn't happen. Um, so there is no counterparty risk, there is no fraud. Uh, it's pretty much instant. Doesn't pretty much doesn't have any fees attached to it. Of course, a bit um, of the exchange fee, uh, but that's normal. Um, so th this is possible right now. Wouldn't this mean that all these uh, separate economies, all these separate tokens, can eventually, uh, you know, be established. And uh, doesn't this mean that they can all fastly and easily interchange their tokens efficiently? Right. So do you think? I that's actually, possible? I actually believe. Well, I actually believe that the frictionless, the frictionlessness that you describe is actually going to make the winner-take-all dynamic even more extreme. Elaborate, please, because I agree. Right. So if you can swap, like, so right now, a lot of, I think a lot of assets, well, even outside of the crazy wrong speculative euphoria that is still yet to fully deflate, um, one of the reasons why there is essentially, like, a market capitalization of every currency or every digital asset is roughly representing the amount of well, not the raw amount. Well, it's it's correlate it's correlated with the amount of wealth that is parked in it, right? And uh, right now, one of the reasons why you still have sort of chunks of wealth around different uh, around sort of a tail end of cryptocurrencies is because the systems are not as frictionless yet as we would like them to be. And it, obviously, we believe that with the greater lightning network and atomic swaps and all these other decentralized exchanges, dark pools, et cetera, um, these sort of these transfers and these systems are going to become more and more fluid and more and more frictionless. Uh, and I think in that world, um, because it's so easy to swap from a lower quality coin to a higher quality coin, and more importantly, for a, from a lower liquidity coin to a higher liquidity coin, you're, you're essentially like, it's going to be even easier to, that, that convergence is only going to accelerate. And sort of there's going to be even less incentives or barriers for your wealth to be parked elsewhere. Exactly. At least in the, at least in the digital realm. I, I agree, and and you know, in such a scenario, I would much more see the uh, scenario that I personally do hold Bitcoin 
all the time everywhere and i if i walk into a store uh, and they say uh they don't accept bitcoin but rather litecoin i ask them like what seriously okay uh that's kind of weird are you sure i, I double check if they're not kidding uh because it's it would be a bit bizarre <laughs> but if right. so then i'm like okay well i only have bitcoin i don't care i'm just going to swap right now over lightning my bitcoin for a few litecoin exactly the amount that i need to pay you because i don't want to hold any of that um and uh, this means that i don't have to touch this other network this inferior network and uh, what happens i just uh you know immediately uh sell litecoin again as soon as i bought it right exactly so what what i, I previously talked a little bit about the um uh, protocol aspects of uh you know one major protocol being the one that is going to take over and we've seen that um several times like for example at, at vhs um you know th that was just the standard that took over of course uh dvds and blu-rays uh with this long battle and mp3 formats and and uh, of course the internet uh, with hhtp and and everything um all these major networks have re have finally reached a uh, let's say rather stable consensus on which network is being used uh, a shelling point so to say so to speak and uh, this might as well be the same in bitcoin uh, because it is just really useful if there is a well-established uh, library base a well-established code base easy compilers and and all the technical stuff that you need for developers to fully function and to build secure and trusted applications um, so, Murad, where do you see more on the technical network side, the aspects of, uh, let's say, centralization or, uh, you know, a tendency towards one money and one protocol? Well, we see similar phenomena with other protocols. Um, TCP IP is frequently brought as an example of a protocol. And it's important to understand that money can be viewed as a protocol as well. So TCP IP and the internet at large are obviously um, a protocol and a set of protocols respectively. And right now the world doesn't really have several internets. I mean, you can make an argument that um, different countries have some have firewalls, et cetera, but really they're still running on the same set of protocols and the same set of rules. And um, money, other than being a monetary unit and, or a financial asset, it can also be viewed as a protocol and it can be viewed as sort of a communications tool. It can be viewed as a sort of an informational vessel. And it's just much easier for the world to collaborate, for people to travel, for cross-border business to occur, and for commerce in general to be expanded in various ways if we use uh, not only the same media of exchange, but also the same unit of account. And I think similarly to what we're seeing with uh, what, what, what we're seeing for the past 40 years with TCP IP, uh, which is a protocol that I believe got started in uh, or got finalized, at least in the 80s. And it's still uh, a very robust and important part of sort of the Internet stack. Uh, I think we're going to see the same type of standard standardization with Bitcoin. and um, the critical issue here is that, uh, and this is this is what a lot of people who say, oh, like the first cryptocurrency is usually not, like the first technology is not going to be the winner. But it's important to understand that Bitcoin isn't a company and it's not a website and it's not a social network, but rather it's a protocol. And TCP IP was arguably one of the first protocols and it's still thriving up to this day. And importantly, Bitcoin really is not the first example of a digital currency, or if anything, it's the sixth or the seventh example, because we had um, uh, we had eGold in the 2000s. We had uh, sort of Xiaomi and eCash technologies in the 90s. We had Mojo Nation. There were a lot of different. We had Liberty Dollars. There were a lot of attempts. Bitcoin isn't the first digital currency. It's the first successful digital currency. And I still think um, to add to all these points, 
it's important to note that Bitcoin isn't static and Bitcoin is constantly improving as a protocol and as a monetary unit and as um, sort of as a uh, monetary system and a technology. And I believe that Bitcoin is a 10x improvement over conventional fiat money. And I think that doing yet another 10x improvement over Bitcoin is much harder than what Bitcoin has already done. So it's going to be a very, very uphill battle, both from a technological point, but also from a Lindy effect point for any kind of uh, another altcoin to disrupt Bitcoin. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and another point that often comes up is the uh, local uh, distinction, the uh, national distinction of the currencies that are in use that you have in each country, in each region, a separate distinct currency. And of course, the argument here is that it supports the local uh, community and, and, and that it is only used by these really, you know, intertied into the community. And uh, you can trust this network because it is your, your local town, your local village, uh, your local city. Um, and of course, you know, create some patriotism. Um, and what would we say about this argument of national and local currencies? Well, both both safety and Hans Hermann Hoppe write about this. And essentially, monetary nationalism, I believe it's something that authorities use to essentially, as a form of propaganda and and in order to um, guilt trip people into saying, oh, wow, you want to use sort of uh, an, your enemy's currency? Or don't you want your people to have your own currency? And it's essentially like a political tool that's being twisted. And really, it's for the purposes, I mean, fiat exists, among other reasons, to finance the state. And it exists to collect seniorage. Um, now, of course, all governments around the world don't want to use this ability. And I really like Hans Hermann, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe's quote, which um, says that really what we have today, which is essentially uh, more than 100 fiat currencies around the world, it is really a mild state of barter because when you're a business or a company that wants to tr do business, do some imports, exports with a, um, another company in another country, you need to go through all these currency exchanges, which essentially like is very eerily similar to barter. And to me, this is just a set of frictions and the world economy could be so much better faster and more frictionless if we just had one global robust currency and more importantly which was not under anyone's any single party's control but rather was under the control of the free market as a whole hello Max? Yeah, so, I mean, there's just so much to discuss. Um, there's two other topics that I generally wanted to talk about very briefly today. Um, the next topic is really a lot of people are, a lot of people are really concerned with where the Bitcoin bottom is going to be. Obviously, the closer you buy or rebuy or add positions to the bottom, 
um, the better your financial results going forward are going to be. Because um, at least I personally, uh, and I believe many of you guys do as well, uh, believe that this the Bitcoin long trend bull market will continue. And I believe sooner or later, be it one year from now, two years from now, or even five years from now, it doesn't matter. But I do believe that Bitcoin will eventually be more than $100,000 per coin. But um, what's important isn't the precise bottom. More importantly, something that I realized recently. And um, I guess to a lot of you, it might have already been obvious. But really, I only sort of um, realized it rec recently. Um, and um, what's important is the monetization. And uh, um, what I realized recently is that if Bitcoin bottoms out at, let's say, anywhere above 2,500, then in my mind, that is super, super bullish for Bitcoin long term. Because if you think about it, then that is exactly what a long-term store of value does and has to do. Um, and displaying to the world that essentially the next bottom or this bottom is higher than the previous top. Or let's say the previous top was 1,200. The previous major top was 1,200. If now the bottom is um, twice that, let's say 2,500 then really in my mind, that's it, that is, and especially if you sort of take a very, very long-term view on monetization, that is very, very bullish for Bitcoin long-term because it will essentially show the world that Bitcoin is slowly monetizing, right? And this would confirm yet another major data point, and this would give us yet another sort of weapon in our arsenal, and it will help us push the narrative that you see, guys, it's strengthening. Because um, it's really, really funny. Despite all these, um, despite all these, if, if you ignore all these crazy bull runs and collapses and all these euphorias, etc., really, B Bitcoin is just increasing in price very, very slowly and very steadily. And essentially, if you said once again, if you ignore these emotional bull runs that are driven by these sort of primitive human emotions like fear and greed, et cetera, and these cycles, you notice that like the respective tops and bottoms are slowly going, going higher and higher every four years. And really, in my mind, it just shows that Bitcoin is monetizing. That means that more and more people with capital around the world are confident in Bitcoin and believe in Bitcoin and are willing to make a bet that this is going to be a future store of value. And really, it shows to me that hyper-Bitcoinization is slowly happening. And that's why it's, it's very, very interesting. Now, And, and uh, just, just yeah. to emphasize, even how even if it sounds so bad to bottom out at 2,500, you have to remember that in early 2017, we were at 1,000. So that right. would mean in one and a half years, 250 return, percent return. Pretty much to the bottom, of course, almost infinite in, in return when you sold on the top. Obviously, that was crazy, but still on, on the bottom now, it's still in one and a half years. That's amazing. And if you calculate it from the last bottom, it, it's got probably going to be an even greater return on your investment. Uh, so, this shows if you hold longer than a couple of years, this will be a good store of value. And the more, the more often Bitcoin proves this point, uh, the longer Bitcoin survives, the stronger this Lindsay effect is going to be. Precisely. And uh, I really want to sort of um, mention another point, which is something that I realized this morning is um, this is very, very interesting stuff. Um, Bitcoin has gotten where it is, I would argue, without... And we're roughly at $100 billion, which is a very, very major point. We are one-tenth of a trillion. Um, now, 
Bitcoin has gotten to where it is, I would argue, without major global macro weaknesses, without major global macro catalysts. I, I don't really consider what happened in Cyprus in 2012, 2013, Greece. Uh, I, to me, that was even Lira or Iran today. That's still too small. And essentially, I would argue that Bitcoin has gotten to where it is today without major global catalysts and with an inflation that until recently was essentially higher than the dollar. Right now, imagine what's going to happen when Bitcoin is far more disinflationary than any fiat and even gold, which is going to be the case in the, uh, in the next seven or eight years. And and at the same time a series of macroeconomic weaknesses occur and shock the world. I think at that point in time, Bitcoin is going to absorb a lot of wealth and you will see a lot of wealth flow into Bitcoin. And really, I will say um, money at the end of the day is all about trust. In the chaos, in the case of fiat money, uh, it's three things. Because money, because fiat money is a debt-based asset, you essentially have to rely on the revenues, aka sort of the creditability of the whole system. Two, you need to um, have trust that the government, of course, the government is going to de continuously debase and dilute the currency, but at least in the case of sort of the more high quality fiat currencies, you trust that they're not going to dilute it too fast. Although... According to official statistics, the dollar is getting printed at 6.3% per year in terms of its supply. So its supply is essentially growing exponentially. And third of all, um, I would argue that the third thing that it's that is making a currency strong is demand. And in the case of fiat currency, it's the enforceability of demand. And essentially, they're using legal tender laws and they're using... Um, sort of debt extinguishing laws to create the sort of artificial floor and artificial demand for the currency. And I've noticed you're looking at the current inflation rate for Bitcoin, which is technically 3.8%. However, exactly. that is the number, that is the number we have to realize, unfortunately, we, we might still have to wait for two or three more years to see our dreams. But um, the 3.8% number is unfortunately going off of the 21 million number. But um, there, according to many people's calculations, up to 4 million Bitcoins have already been lost. So uh, really, um, if we go, instead of going off of the 21 million number, if we go off of the 17 million number, um, then the inflation rate is somewhere around 5 or 6%. Um, if okay, we okay. go... That is actually right. an interesting aspect, that we have to yeah. calculate the lost coins the quote unquote right. lost coins we right know if they exactly are, right? because you're right because unfortunately if you um if you you can't really go off of 21 million because the 4 million have already been lost so essentially like it's 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 just like they're they're lost forever right and um at the when all is said and done at the end of the day 20 years from today um, I also believe that sort of the key as infrastructure around Bitcoin keeps inc improving and as Bitcoin is increasingly viewed as more precious, people will be more and more careful, a lot more careful and people will consider them to be a lot more precious. Right. And so I think that the number of private key losses per year are going to um, decrease. And I think like when all is said and done, like the total supply of Bitcoin, say 50, 60 years from now. It's probably going to be somewhere around 15 or 16 million, right? This and is so like, crazy. Right. There, and if we there, go are, off of there are going to be less Bitcoin available in 100 years than there are currently. Right. Right. Hold so on Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Bitcoin isn't Bitcoin. Technically, technically, Bitcoin isn't disinflationary. It's like full on deflationary. Right. Obviously, hopefully it will sort of reach an asymptotic sort of plateau in terms of losses. But um, yeah, we we might as well consider Bitcoin supply to be at like 16 million or something, right? And that's why I think like the 3.8% number is a bit, um, uh, it's still not quite that. It's it's a bit more. It's it's five, five and a half percent or something along along those lines. We still need to wait a couple more years where, before it's 3.8%. But in any case, by the year 2030, uh, Bitcoin's stock to flow ratio is going to be even higher than gold, not to mention all the other fiats. And um, it's going to be less than 1% and continue to, to decrease. 
0.9% one year, 0.8%, etc. It's getting um, harder and harder. And technically, as we've already discussed, Bitcoin is becoming harder and sounder every 10 minutes. Uh, and halvings in, particularly, uh, in particular are very big jumps. But yeah, um, we need to wait a couple more years for the hardness of the currency to be felt more intimately. Um, and the market is still not pricing it, in my view. The market is still not realizing how powerful sound money really is and just how hard Bitcoin really is. I like to tell my friends, we never had an asset, let alone a money, this hard before. Um, and I'll just end off on one last point. Um, if, and this is more sort of crazy on my part, but I believe that this is going to happen at least by the time of my death. Um, if, and I'm not considering any inflation, any hyperinflation, any dollar dilution in anything. I'm just using the numbers going off of the August 2018 dollar terms. So right now, according to calculations, monetary metals are roughly eight trillion, and interestingly, um, in, in market cap and um, fiat, all the fiat around the world is around ninety trillion. Now I believe that at its peak, and at its full maturity, and at its full adoption, Bitcoin is going to be at least two times as big, because if leaky, inflationary um dilutable quote unquote hot potato like fiat currencies are cumulatively 90 trillion dollars in total market capitalization which is which is roughly the amount of wealth that is stored there in those paper notes then just imagine how much more how much bigger and higher the marginal propensity to hold bitcoin is going to be which instead of depreciating at 3% per year is going to be appreciating at 2 or 3% per year due to their scarcity and even key losses, right? And that's why I think in August 2018 dollar terms, Bitcoin is going to be $200 trillion, which means that if Bitcoin today is 0.1 trillion, then that means that in the next 10, 20, 30 years, Bitcoin, if you have a low time preference and if you have patience, and I believe the patience is virtue, Bitcoin still has a thousand X to go, perhaps even 2000 X to go. So that's Absolutely. that's my point. Absolutely. And what we see here, of course, is that Bitcoin is this unique asset that actually continues in its predictability of the money supply. So we don't just only know exactly how many Bitcoin are in existence in the past and in the present, but also in the future which is something that we had never had in any any uh, money. And by the way, Murad, one thing that is missing here, uh, and I, uh, I thank uh, Blake Anderson for pointing that out, is uh, the gold supply. Uh, so you really should have the gold supply in here as well, because that is quite predictable as well. Uh, so it might be interesting to add this to this nice uh, little chart. And right. uh, further, um, you you spoke about the uh, uh, this or you, you spoke about the importance of having a uh, you know of of measuring this the, this new asset in terms of old fiat money, but of course what we have is a massive century long devaluate or devaluation of a currency that was used pretty much all over the globe by now, and. Uh, this means that we have distorted the calculation process so thoroughly and fully that any valuation that we have right now will not even come close to what is the true and fundamental sound value of such a currency. Uh, pretty much not just of Bitcoin, but of any price. Uh, so we are completely in the dark right now. And uh, only sound money can uh, bring us back into... Uh, the economic clarity of of where to allocate which resources. So I would argue that we have no idea where the fiat term of Bitcoin is going to be really soon. Uh, uh, because it is literally impossible to know how much this fiat bullshit show is going to devaluate uh, and how many resources have to be reallocated and 
how much uh, of a rapid shift is going to happen in this move towards a sound and uh, a thorough economic calculation again. Exactly. Agreed fully. So, and then lastly, uh, you wanted to talk about, uh, wait, we talked about the multi-coin phenomena, right? Yeah, I've, I've, covered, I've covered all the topics while you were away. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. no, I missed something. <laughs> yeah. um, well, th then I would just like to add here um, uh, that I want to thank you for one uh, fantastic uh, podcast that you int introduced me to, and this is the Crypto Voices podcast. Uh, oh yeah, this is, it'll be fun. right, right. This is hosted yeah. upon others by Fernando Ulrich, which oh, is I love, uh, I love Fernando. He's great. I also strongly recommend um, his last five um, articles on Medium, and he essentially he makes the best case I've seen thus far why it has to first be a store of value, and then a medium of exchange, and then a unit of account. I, and that's what a lot of a lot of shit coiners, no no coiners, alt coiners, b cashers, they don't understand how how it has to evolve, and it's, it's just so important that we need to first saturate store value before um, we can move on to sort of higher level uses. Oh yeah, absolutely, and uh, you know, uh, is this is this mainly because. Uh, or, or you know, would you say that it can happen in a more, uh, let's say, some symbiosis way that you have a incurrent, uh, you know, a growing of both the store of value and medium of exchange aspect? Uh, so, so I like to think I like to think of it. Of course, they are inextricably linked, and they are technically moving together. But I like to think of it as waves. So you have one wave, and then the, another wave is overlapping, and then another wave is overlapping. You know, kind of like a sine wave or three sine waves. You know what I mean? Because like this is the thing. Like, um, why would you spend your Bitcoin today? If you are buying in Bitcoin, then you are essentially believing or or betting on the possibility of a future where Bitcoin is much, much, much at least a hundred times more valuable than it is today, right? So why would you go and spend that on coffee? That makes no sense. Bitcoin right now, its main use case is to be hodled, is to be bought, hodled, and stored. And then you want to encourage more people to do the same. And it's not a Ponzi scheme because Bitcoin is objectively a superior form of money. Um, it's not a Ponzi scheme because it is really zero sum. And if Bitcoin is to win, this is going to happen at the expense of other monetary media around the world. But essentially, forcing or asking people to spend their Bitcoin today, that's like uh, buying a stock of, an, of a very promising early stage startup and then going to Starbucks and spending that stock on coffee. That just makes no sense. Well, absolutely. And what you talk about here is Gresham's law, right? It is yeah. that um, artificially, and artificially is important here, it is only by government degree that, it, uh, that this involves. It is that artificially overvalued money will drive out artificially undervalued money. Uh, basically, especially in the context of Bitcoin, this means that if you have a uh, if you have a Bitcoin in your pocket or on your phone or on your ledger or treasure, and you have a fiat, dirty fiat paper in your hand, uh, and you go to the coffee shop, what are you go uh, What are you going to buy? Well, uh, what are you going to exchange with? Well, obviously, you want to get rid of the dirty fiat money first because Bitcoin is just so much more precious. Right. Exactly. Now, uh, that this economic law ends as soon as you have. Uh, spend your last amount of fiat as soon as you as you are out of the system um, and completely uh, exited the fiat system Gresham's law no longer applies you will have to spend your Bitcoin because you do not have anything else to spend so when you have right. reached 100% hodler when you are all into Bitcoin uh, which is arguably good or bad um, that is your own judgment um, 
but at that point, you have to spend Bitcoin. So that is when Gresham's law actually ends and when the speculative attack has fully reached its capacity. Right. Exactly. Well, the people from the Nakamoto Institute also like to talk about how when sort of we will be on our way to hyper Bitcoinization, people will be borrowing in fiat in order to buy Bitcoin and like that very act weakens fiat and strengthens Bitcoin even more. And I imagine if many, many millions of people try to do something similar, it essentially accelerates the inevitable. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, this is something that then leads further into the uh, so-called speculative attack. That basically means whoever has, um, whoever has uh, or is still holding on to this dirty fiat money, um, these people will be hit really hard um, in such a hyper Bitcoinization, so to speak, uh, because it is logical for, for people to go into debt in fiat money because it will inflate uh, to nothingness. And uh, this means that you're incentivized to go into debt and consume today uh, because you will have to pay back the money uh, with a less purchasing power uh, money in the future. Um, and this will happen. But what will you buy with this new money that you just newly printed? As soon as you newly print it, um, this will increase the money supply. So going into the debt will increase even further the money supply, uh, which will, of course, make the currency much more inflationary, which will lead to much more uh, indebtedness, which will lead to a much higher uh, supply of money. So it's a vicious circle, further devaluing the currency and increasing the demand for, for, for loans, for debt. And what happens if you use this newly created money, this debt that you just take on to buy hard money, to buy sound money like Bitcoin, like gold, that you cannot inflate. Now more and more people are buying gold, uh, but they cannot produce more. They cannot mine any additional Bitcoins thanks to the difficulty adjustment, which is incredibly smart. And uh, this will mean that the uh, holders of the sound money, the Bitcoin hodlers, the gold bugs, they will appreciate in purchasing power immensely uh, compared to those who are still hoarding the dirty fiat money. Uh, and this will be a rapid displacement uh, of value and wealth uh, that, is, uh, that might be unprecedented in history. Right. No, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, the people, uh, Pierre Rochard likes to joke that, um, or, or not joke, he likes to say that um, if uh, kind of a, accepting hyper Bitcoinization is like one of the ways for uh, the particularly indebted governments to uh, get rid of their debt problem. Because, you know, like a lot of governments have tens uh, of trillions of dollars of debt. Right. And essentially a lot of this debt is denominated in nominally denominated in their local fiat currencies. And if you allow for hyper Bitcoinization to happen, and uh, then uh, you um, essentially allow your own currency to in essentially hyperinflate, then it's so much easier to pay back those debts. So, I mean, on one hand, of course, they would lose their monetary authority and trust in their currency and credibility for a very long time, if not forever. But at the same time, if um, if this were to happen, then essentially they get what what's what's called a debt jubilee, and essentially it would be a way to quote unquote have an excuse because of oh, Bitcoin hyper Bitcoinization happened. All the, they they don't need to pay those debts anymore, or only pay a small fraction of you know of the value of those debts. So yeah. Oh, absolutely, and it is it is curious how this vicious cycle of further increase in the money supply and further decrease in the valuation of the fiat currency. Um, you know, is completely decreasing the value of of all the fiat money. Um, and I know that that you've read, of course, uh, Saifedean's fantastic book uh, on the uh, the Bitcoin standard, of course. On uh, and one part that he talks about here is the beauty of the difficulty adjustment. And uh, Mustak Murak, could, could you please elaborate a bit further on how this? Uh, adjustment of the difficulty has ultimate economic effects? Well, 
the difficulty adjustment is really I, I, what I consider to be the most important aspect of Bitcoin's design. And to me, really, it's, it's, it's the most ingenious part of Satoshi's design. And this is because um, the difficulty adjustment is precisely what makes Bitcoin sound money. And it makes it even sounder than gold. Because uh, for gold, um, the stock to flow is relatively high because um, it's expensive to dig more gold out of the ground. But really, as a human race collectively, like it's still possible to uh, increase the supply of gold beyond a certain point if we really, really tried. And really what we're limited by is time and the profitability, et cetera, et cetera. But with Bitcoin, it's completely different. The supply curve is very strict and it's predetermined. And it, it is very, 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 in my mind, unlikely to change. And this is why Bitcoin, Bitcoin's supply curve and stock to flow ratio is essentially uh, even more sound than gold and becoming harder and harder with every minute, month, year, etc. Oh, absolutely. Yes, this is, uh, this is really something that is going to be interesting how this whole thing plays out. Well, Murad, I'm, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, today or tonight. It's been, as always, fantastic talking to you. Um, and uh, of you. course, uh, people can, uh, can find more, out more about you uh, on Twitter, uh, and I repeat, you're a, a great Twitter follower. Um, so what uh, other stuff are you currently working on? And uh, yeah, what do you have planned? Um, I'm in the process of starting a um, cryptocurrency fund. And I'm also looking at several ways to promote uh, Bitcoin around the world to dismiss a lot of FUD concerns, worries, anxieties about Bitcoin and generally uh, thinking and working on some ways to sort of promote and increase um, Bitcoin knowledge and Bitcoin education around the world. Okay, perfect. Well, that is fantastic. Um, uh, we, we really have to hurry now because the Bitcoin group is starting right after. Uh, so with Thomas Hunt, uh, Gabriel Devine and Blake Anderson and me um, live in a couple seconds here on the World Crypto Network. You can find out more about me on uh, on Twitter at Hillebrand Max, uh, and if you want to donate to a video uh, that will be coming up on the Purism laptop, uh, the open source hardware and software amazing uh, solution that will fully protect your privacy and be 100 or let's hope really secure. Uh, we need roughly 0.3 Bitcoin for this. Uh, we already have now I think uh, many donations here. Uh, and in total, 0.016 Bitcoin, so that is fantastic. Uh, I thank very much uh, those. Uh, th this one is the newest here uh, from 35JZ. Uh, so very, very much, uh, 0.0075 Bitcoin, that is fantastic. Um, and uh, this is magic internet money. It blows me away any, every time. Uh, I thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, see you on the next show. Bye-bye.